With that said, our next speaker is Mayoko Inoue. She's going to talk about um, paying it forward and helping the next generation of developers um, learn their craft. So please welcome Mayoko. It's a little tall. OK, cool. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to my talk. My name is Mayuko. Um, I have an entire 45 minutes to talk to you all today for my talk titled, Pay It Forward by Being You, Extending a Hand to the Next Generation of Apple Developers. So of these 45 minutes, I'll probably only talk for like 20 minutes since my own attention span is about that much, if not shorter. Um, we'll do some Q&A at the end, and then we'll probably end early to go off and enjoy the rest of what I know some of y'all call Christmas week. Christmas week, every, yeah. <laughs> uh, before we start, actually, one of, these th one of the things that I always struggled with at WWDC week was meeting new people. There are so many people from all over the world here this week, but making connections is really hard precisely because there are so many people. It's weirdly isolating and lonely, even though a big part of WWDC week is to learn who else is out there in the developer community. So. I want to create a space where we get to know each other a little bit, right here, right now, if that's okay with y'all. What I want you to do right now is to turn to someone you don't know. Introduce yourselves, say your name, where you're from, what you do, and also share what you wanted to be growing up. I'm going to give us about two minutes to do this. If you have extra time, find another neighbor. If you're sitting out, out there, come into the middle, meet some people. I'm going to start the timer now. Nice to meet you. Where you go? I love, I love your energy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> deep conversation. If y'all could bring it back to the stage, that would be awesome. Cool. Thank you all so much for participating in that. I heard some good buzz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope you all were able to make one or more connections during this time and that your horizons were expanded. Now, Moving on to the talk. Again, my name's Mayugo Inoue. I'm an iOS developer currently working at Netflix. I'm originally from sunny San Diego, California, and I'm a second generation Japanese American woman. 
I also strongly identify as a millennial and as an ENFJ, and as someone who feels emotion way too strongly, which is why I skip the scariest seasons of TV shows, including Game of Thrones. <laughs> My superpower is that when I laugh really hard, I start crying because I'm just so happy to be alive. <laughs> and almost two years ago, I started a YouTube channel and it changed my life. Today, I wanted to share my story on who I am and how I got here, talk about what I've learned, and then provide my perspectives on how I think we can extend a hand to the next generation of Apple developers. So, for college, I went to UC San Diego. By a stroke of literal luck, I found my way into the computer science program. Until then, I hadn't even considered that major. I was by no means the best student in the class. In fact, I'm pretty sure I was always in the bottom half grade-wise. I felt like the classes were unreasonably hard and my learning style was so different from how professors at UCSD taught that I really struggled in school. So it's no surprise that I felt like I was really terrible at coding for four years. But after a grueling and honestly failure-ridden four years, I earned my bachelor's in CS. Luckily, after college, I got my first job out as an iOS developer through an early career program. And I've been doing iOS development ever since. And let's just say I've gotten better at coding. In the last five years, I've worked on an app that helps small business owners manage their finances. And on an app that helps creators make a consistent and sustainable income. And now I'm helping to deliver groundbreaking stories that enable people from all over the world to see life from different perspectives because we all know that's what we really need right now. And at the root of all this, my passions were what motivated me to work in tech. Helping people, creativity, the arts, storytelling. It's all the things that make me feel so human. It's the stuff that you can't put a price on or even do justice in trying to describe those things with words sometimes. The fact that I can use my skills as a software engineer to work on projects and apps that I personally care about and that could span a wide range of topics was why I decided to become a software engineer. I have the incredible privilege of getting to do this. About two years ago, I really wanted to communicate this kind of story, my story, to more people. I wanted to show that someone like me, a woman, a Japanese American, a person who had a rough start in software engineering, was working in tech. I mean, really, I wanted to demystify what working in tech was really like. Because when I was younger, I was definitely afraid of the tech industry, because it felt like this large, scary monster with a lot of money that only invited and accepted a certain type of person to the party. But I was here at the party, and I was enjoying myself. So, as any millennial would do, I decided to do this by posting my story online on YouTube. My first video was titled, A Day in the Life of a Software Engineer, and to date it has almost four million views. I showed, a different, I showed the different landscapes I walk through in a typical day as a software engineer. I don't do any talking in the video. I really tried to portray my life as it really was, not anything more or anything less. I wanted it to honestly represent a day in my life. When I first posted it, I had no idea that it would get the attention that it did. Heck, I was happy if any of my real friends actually watched it, but to my surprise, it was really successful. Following my day in the life video, I've talked about how to deal with imposter syndrome, the significance of emotional vulnerability at work, and how to express your style in a world where literally the most important figures in tech wear the same outfit to work every single day. These and more are all important lessons I learned through my own journey of navigating the tech world. 
and I wanted to share my perspective on things that I thought about all the time as a software engineer to a wide audience. And the best part of sharing my story online and making these videos was that people started to message me and told me their story about who they were, where they're from, about their interests in tech, and what matters to them, which is so cool. Especially because most of these people, if not for the internet and my videos, I would have never met otherwise. Their perspectives really widened my worldview. A lot of people told me that my videos really resonated with them and that they could relate to the things that I've talked about. Today, I have over 222,000 subscribers, and I think this speaks to the hunger of people outside of the tech industry to learn more about what it's like being here. And during all this video making, I really started to think about what can I actually do other than make videos to help these people into the tech industry and help them thrive here. After all, the message I kept hearing from tech companies I worked at was that there aren't enough software engineers in the world to fill all the roles that tech companies are hiring for. And yet, through my little window that I created via YouTube and social media, it looked like there were tons of people who were seriously trying to get here from all different backgrounds who were having a lot of trouble. So I figured, let's start by making an impact in the specific community I'm in, the iOS developer community. As a way to dig into this, I decided to get more involved with the recruiting process at my company at the time, since we were hiring for another iOS engineer. I wanted to understand what the diversity of the talent pool of iOS engineers really looked like, and whether I could better understand where the friction was for folks to get into iOS development. Over time, I started noticing imbalances as we reviewed and interviewed candidates. Specifically, there was a severe lack of on-site interview candidates from underrepresented backgrounds, especially people of color. I went and talked to a recruiter to understand what was going on. We were using a recruiting tool that tries to identify underrepresented candidates to source from, and yes, I know the tooling isn't perfect. But our recruiter showed me that, at least on the race dimension, while there are thousands of white and Asian iOS engineers, there were only hundreds of Latinx iOS engineers, and only dozens of black iOS engineers to source from. This was news to me. In a time where so many organizations and companies were working towards diversifying the tech industry than ever before, why was the iOS developer community in the US so racially undiverse? And while I'm talking about race here, I wanna recognize that there are lots of dimensions of diversity, such as sexual orientation, age, gender, socioeconomic background, the list goes on. Diversity is intersectional, and there are lots of different factors that go into someone being who they are. Anyways, I really wanted to understand where I had blind spots, the barriers that people from marginalized communities had to enter this field. So, as one does with the question in the 21st century, I made a tweet asking why, and it reads, I noticed that there are so few people of color working as mobile developers. Is there something unapproachable or inaccessible about mobile dev when compared to other tech fields to get into, like web dev? Or is it something else I'm missing entirely? Let me know your thoughts. Luckily, a bunch of people chimed in and responded with their personal experiences. I'm gonna take a pause here and let you read some of the responses on the screen. So the biggest reason that jumped out at me was that the cost of getting into Apple development overall is extraordinarily high compared to other areas of software engineering like web development or even Android development. When the cheapest Apple laptop on the market costs at least $1,000, and apparently just monitor stands do now too. <laughs> Shots. <laughs> um, and you have to spend much more to have a state-of-the-art development machine, it rules out a lot of groups of people who don't have the economic privilege of buying an Apple product to even start iOS development. The other most common response I got was that Apple development felt really intimidating, usually because they didn't see a linear path into this field. Here's some more responses. I'm gonna pause again to let you read.
So when I hosted a workshop asking my coworkers about how they got into Apple development, every single person said that they had wandered their way here. And I think that's true for a lot of y'all too. A lot of them didn't study computer science and hadn't originally planned on becoming an iOS developer. The perspectives shared in these tweets might be new to you, and they might not be. Some of you have lived this very reality. It's true that economic barriers exist and are widening all over the world. That's something out of this community's control. But there is something we can do. We all know that when solving a problem in technology, it's important to do our research to include and consider all perspectives in order to find the best solution. So it's only natural that we need people from all different backgrounds with different perspectives to build the future of technology with us. But it's these very people who we need, who are the ones having difficulty breaking in. So I argue that it is our responsibility, the ones already here, to welcome and encourage them to join, break down barriers, and build an inclusive environment so that they can thrive here. We should be thinking about how to make this community better and stronger for our future selves and for new people. Each of us here have made it, in one way or another, in being a part of this community. So what can we do to empower the next generation? I say, we figure out new ways to talk about technology. This is definitely coming from the part of me who absolutely loves creativity and stuff, but I really think that making things and putting it out into the world helps create conversations, ideas, thoughts, feelings, and hope and motivation for people. And we desperately need new ideas coming from tech too, or new voices coming from tech. I mean that to some people, my story is neither rare nor novel. But for other people who maybe don't personally know anyone who works as a software engineer, or for people who feel like they're not cut out for computer science because the coursework is really hard, it's refreshing and relatable. So we need you all sitting in the audience to contribute. You can create or contribute to open source projects, write blog posts about both advanced technology topics and introductory ones, create illustrations, books, zines, comics, anything. Swift also prevents a unique opportunity for us here. More people are learning how to code using Swift as their first programming language, which means that for a lot of people, Swift is their entryway into programming and the tech world in general. The possibilities are endless. So today I have three tips on how you can figure out a way to talk about technology in a way that feels authentic to who you are. Number one, have a conversation with yourself to figure out who you are. That answer is where your motivation, confidence, and passion will come from. For some people, it's speaking at conferences. For others, it's mentoring one high school student on programming or illustrating life as a software engineer. For me, it's creating YouTube videos. Ask yourself, what do you want in life? What are you good at? What do you really enjoy doing? And what matters to you? And you'll begin to find your answer. Number two, show people who you are. Show or talk about your different identities and experiences and what you stand for. It's incredibly powerful for people not in tech to see and get to know software engineering individuals in this way. It fills in the gaps of what engineers are typically perceived as and provides a reality that might not otherwise have been known to some people. By doing this, you're providing a beacon of light to people who want to be here and especially to those who identify with you. Number three, 80%. So I feel like overthinking and perfectionism are frequently the evil antagonists that prevent great people from creating awesome things. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't do some careful planning and thoughtful execution. That's all I'm saying. It means that it's just not worth stressing out over the small stuff in a project. We all probably have that blog post or conference talk we've always wanted to do, or maybe we've even written it, but just haven't submitted it to a conference yet because we, it spiraled into a million thoughts. And this sucks. But this is where 80% comes in. 
bring your project to 80% of the way, as good as you can make it, and then let it go. Move on to the next project. I first heard of this from Hank Green, YouTuber, author, and one of the founders of Log Brothers and Crash Course. He has a great video on this titled, The Secret to My Productivity, where he reveals his secret sauce about why projects should be only brought to 80%. And it's because best is subjective. Best for you is different from best for someone else. Different people want best in different things, and there's literally no way to tell what best means for anybody. And therefore, perfect does not exist. And so it won't do you any good to ruminate on making something perfect, since you'll probably be the only person who can see that difference. Perfectionism, I feel, is one of the biggest blockers to creating an impact, so please don't let it. And remember this number, 80%. So here's a summary of the three points I just talked about for how we can figure out new ways of talking about technology together. Figure out who you are, show people who you are, and 80%. At the end of the day, we software engineers have a lot of say in what happens in the tech industry and who's a part of it. It's our responsibility as members of this community to strengthen it by inviting voices who haven't been heard to help build the future of technology. Coming here to AltConf, to WWDC this week, to connect with other Apple developers to, and learn more about what's happening is a really important step in this journey. Since I posted my video two years ago, tons of other people in tech have made their own versions of a day in the life too. People from different companies, different roles, from all over the world decided to peel back the curtain and open up about themselves. This is something I am really proud of, this new way we can talk about the tech industry. And I think this is the key to how we, the Apple community, can extend our hand to the next generation. So let's make sure we continue this energy past this incredible week and find new ways to talk about technology. The most important part of this is to do and say whatever feels authentic to you. So pay it forward by being you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have quite a bit of time left over in the session. So if you have any questions, happy to take them. Um, I think there's a mic coming over there. Hey, I really appreciate what you uh, had to say. I, you. I've been in this business for 40 years as a developer, so a little bit lo longer than some of these folks have been alive. Um, I'm going to second a lot of what you said because it's so true. Uh, the one thing I might add to it is what I found was um, as an engineer, we often want to fix things for people. It's in our nature. And what I discovered that's really, really helpful is rather than be a hero, be a, a champion for folks. And um, you kind of have to look up what I mean by that, but don't fix it for them. Um, help them in a direction and let them go. You're absolutely right about 80%. Um, I don't know what the number really is, but the, the thought is there. People make this mistake all the time. And one of the things I've seen over and over, over 40 years is Software is ephemeral. It's ephemeral art. If you're an artist and you think, oh, I'm going to make this perfect thing, uh, who cares? In, in, in six months, it's gone. Okay? Like, I mean, I built stuff that was hero stuff years ago. Nobody knows about it anymore. Right? Um, I'll throw one last thing, and I think this is really cool. Um, uh, the military was trying to solve this problem where they were trying to teach people, let's look at threats in the future. Right? And potential things, like things that we don't understand that are 10 years out. And so people would write these reports, and they discovered that nobody read the, the tech papers. So what uh, uh, this person did was uh, she started to create um, uh, graphic novels. And eventually she read the graphic novels and made them YouTube videos. But she found, and it's called threat casting. If you ever want to look up the word threat casting labs, it's pretty far out stuff. But she made these graphic novels about how software failures caused this massive, massive you know, failure. And people started to read them. And I realized that, that um, me having a baby boomer having to talk to millennials, I realized I have to speak a slightly different language. And sometimes things like that really help. Anyhow, what you're saying is awesome. Thank Thanks. you so much.
anybody else have questions or want to add something? There's one there, there's one there. Uh, so I just want to say thank you as well for your the story and you know what you've said because it resonated with me as well. Um, and I just wanted to also add that there are also ways to like help locally through things like meetups um, because I know not everyone can be as I just kind of dived into the whole YouTube world myself. Never really considered myself a YouTuber, but then again, I don't see too many folks like me on YouTube doing iOS, doing Swift, so that was also a motivation to be um, that influence for someone else who's looking for that. So um, yeah, just wanted to add the whole meetup piece because I know for a lot of folks, like um, meetups provide this ability to share information on a one-on-one -on -one basis that can resonate better with folks than YouTube can. So. Um, Think of that as an alternative because there's always these little pockets of areas in a city or wherever you may live that could really use a local concentration of like devs getting together and things like that. So. Absolutely, I completely agree with that. I think the first thing that I did out of college because I wanted that kind of interaction was go to a meetup in San Diego called CocoConf, which is being revitalized and has a ton of chapters everywhere. But yeah, in-person meetups are awesome. Meetup.com has a ton of these meetups, as well as I'm sure there's other services out there. But there's so many ways to connect with people. If you live in an area where there are other iOS developers or other software engineers, awesome way. Otherwise, the internet is huge and endless and limitless. So there's a ton of ways to do that too. Question right here. So, uh, oh. I had, uh, you talked about uh, changing the way that we talk about technology. Um, what what would you say are some of the biggest uh, biggest problems in how we're talking about technology today, and what are some practical ways you'd recommend that we actually change that? Totally, great question. I feel like there are maybe like two to five ways that we talk about technology right now, especially pre kind of like me discovering a lot of the YouTube stuff and social media stuff. But I think this also goes for just like how can software engineers level up and become a person that creates impact and goes past their job and stuff. Um, for instance, I remember when I was like, I went, right, right when I first graduated college, I was like, how can I make more of an impact? The first thing that people told me was like, go talk at meetups and conferences. And that was maybe the main thing, also like have a Twitter presence. But I'm realizing like those are very common ways to do it. And that, I'm not saying that those are bad things, but there are lots and lots and lots of other ways to do that. I think we're starting to discover that. I mean, I'm starting to discover it. It's probably existed for a long time on how we do that. So comic book talking about um, software engineering. My friend makes a comic right there, Sean. Check him out, Drive Data, about uh, like life as a software engineer and about iOS development. I have another friend who's also making um, uh, like songs about development as well. And so there's so many new mediums that I feel like haven't been explored yet and also haven't had the stage or the recognition of how to talk about software engineering. Um, I think different ways of talking about software engineering resonates with different kinds of people. And so in order to welcome more kinds of people, we have to talk about it in more ways. Um, so I, I think the creativity, like I don't know where it's gonna lead us and a lot of it is left unlocked, I think a little bit by a lot of people. And so I really urge you all to kind of dig deep and see what's there. But I, I think the potential here is awesome and it's limitless, so cool. Yes, I saw, okay, yeah, you have a mic. Yeah, uh, I, my name is Curtis and uh, I saw a slide that really resonated with me was uh, more or less about exposure um, you know, I, I grew up wanting to draw comic books, I, and, and I eventually folded that into graphic design, and, and I was fairly successful at a young age doing it, but what ended up, uh, how I ended up in engineering was actually an internship. I had never met a software engineer. I had no idea of, like, what that even meant. Um, I had a lot of great mentors that didn't look like me. They weren't from the place that I was. But they said, well, you know, you're young enough, you should actually go learn more about computers. And I followed that advice and it was very, I mean, it, it literally changed my life because it not only made me a better artist, but it also, uh, or a creative, but it made me also a, a you know, a pretty decent engineer. Um, as far as the exposure, how, how can we, because um, I saw that YouTube and and being more of the, the influential piece is, is definitely in vogue now. 
but are there other ways that we can do that inside of a workplace for folks that, uh, like right now I work with an admin that is, she's very interested in the software engineering space and she has no background for anything other than just kind of being more of a generalist. Like, is there a way to kind of coach that and help that within an organization already or what would you recommend? Yeah, I think that you touched on a really important part there about mentorship and sponsorship. Do, and I think that is kind of the best way to do that within an organization right now. So mentoring other people who maybe are more junior or maybe even more senior, just wanting to learn a new skill set is really important. Also having just like having someone who is in that position who wants to learn more and, and them having someone that they can connect to and ask questions with and have a relationship with is incredibly powerful. I remember when I was like starting off, I had two mentors and I still keep in touch with them because they were just instrumental in giving me the opportunities that I needed and also giving me the confidence and the support that I needed to go forward. Um, I think whenever you're starting anything new, it's extremely terrifying. You don't know if you're making the right decision and it's super scary. And so having that like person to just talk to, to support and also answer questions and pair program with is really important. So if your company has like mentorship programs, that's awesome. Um, there's like a Slack bot you can install called Coffee Dates, I think too, if you just wanna like meet more people and get to know um, who else is out there and who you can learn from. But yeah, I think that's an awesome way like uh, employee resource groups are also an awesome way. Whatever can happen within a company for people to connect to each other and talk to each other about things, um, about work and not work, I think there's always good stuff that comes out of that, so. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Yasmin. Um, I think it goes on the same line. I'm gonna try to make my thoughts into a question. And uh, so uh, the part about validation and knowing that you're good enough, like you said that when you got out of college, you thought you were not a good developer. And I think many, many of us have this thought. Um, there's so many things to do in Swift and iOS and we might not know all of them. And we're like, oh, I don't know this stuff. So I'm not a good programmer. Um, how can we know it or maybe help other people know that too, that they are good enough and what they have to do to get better or just like help people knowing that they are enough and what they need to do to get to the next step. Great question. First of all, I think your intent is awesome and that is the first step mm -hmm. of wanting to help other people, letting them know that they're good enough. Like who, raise your hand if you have an imposter syndrome about coding and software engineering, whether you're good enough. Yeah, like a ton of people, right? And so, but this conversation of being good enough and imposter syndrome and stuff doesn't really come up in the workplace. And so I think bringing it up in the workplace, honestly, is a great way to do that. Um, depending on who you are, you ask for different methods of help. Like for me, I'm someone who literally needs just a lot of positive affirmation. I need someone to be like, well, you go, you're doing a great job. And then I'm like, yay, thank you for loving me. And I'm so happy. Other people really just want to tinker away and get their own confidence of figuring out something and get that sense of accomplishment on their own. And then that's how they get rid of imposter syndrome. So I think if there is someone that you really want to support who seems like they're having a tough time, then like having a conversation with them being like, how can I support you? Like, what are ways that I can, you know, give you confidence and guidance and support? Because, yeah, again, ev everyone has a different way of doing that. And so um, building relationships is a key part of that. And sometimes, you know, even just like, I don't know, we introduced a new thing at work called like kudos, for instance, where like you, you uh, give kudos to like a person who you thought did a really good job and went above and beyond or really overcame something challenging to give some public recognition. Um, kudos, kudos is like a, Mm, what's a good word? Uh, praise. praise, yeah, that's a good alternative, yeah. So you, um, we just introduced that as part of like a weekly meeting thing as a way to just be like, let's talk about feelings for a little bit and appreciate that we're all human and we feel scared sometimes and we challenge ourselves every day and we should commend ourselves. Yeah, I, I mean, I think like the, well, the worst times, is, I think actually in college is what I felt this, was, is when you are working so hard but you don't feel like you're doing a good job and no one else around you is seeing that or helping you through that. And so I think the more you talk about it, uh, the better it can get. Yeah. Um, question, yes. Yeah. Um, you talked about barriers like uh, the cost of equipment and the like. Um, another barrier that I've been seeing a lot of, of just even getting in 
is uh, location. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know great uh, developers in, say, uh, Mobile, Alabama. But step one, oh, you have to come to California. It's like, but he has a uh, family who he takes care of. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm not, he can't move to California. I, I live in North Carolina. I have, my, my children are in high school. I'm, I, I'm not going to pick them up and move them to San Francisco. But there seems to be this, like, the only place, it's like, I can't seem to find any, uh, I can't find a diverse group of people when I look out the window mm -hmm. and never look anywhere else. I don't know how we can expand that to, you know, Mass and Wisconsin or Kentucky and Iowa. And I know folks in Mexico who have a really hard, you know, do great work, but people are like, well, but you're in Mexico. I don't know. Yeah. If anybody has the answer to this question, let me know, because it's, it's a tough one. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I mean, I don't know the right solution of it. It's probably like multiple solutions, and even still, like even if I have a solution, like, you know, the whole industry has to change. Um, the fact that Silicon Valley is seen as a tech hub is a good thing for Silicon Valley, and, but like you said, for anybody who wants to be in tech who has to move here, it's like a lot. Like living in the Bay Area is stressful, it's expensive, if you have a family, finding a good house is just like so much emotional labor that you have to go through that I completely understand why people just want to like stay where they are, they're happy there, why not let them thrive there? I'm a huge fan of like remote work policies, and so I think more and more companies are allowing for, um, I guess, distributed is the right word, um, distributed employees, like GitHub kind of leads in this space and a lot of other companies as well. Um, I wish more companies did this. Obviously, there's a lot of barriers to that, like how do you handle communication and time zones, which can be really difficult. But at the end of the day, it's like you want really good people from all parts of the world contributing to technology, not just the people who graduated from Stanford and Palo Alto, <laughs> or not just the people living in San Francisco, because it is an immense privilege to be able to do that and to be able to like uplift your life from somewhere and move somewhere, especially if like even if you're coming from a different country. Um, so I think I always try to like talk about this at every new company that I'm at and like what is the remote work policy, is, what are we thinking about there. Um, it's always a source of friction. Some companies have done a great job in converting to being more friendly in that way. Um, some companies not. And so I hope to see that in the coming 10, 20 years, it just becomes like more of that. Um, there's also the whole thing of like each city is like this is the new up and coming tech hub. No, this is the up and coming <laughs> tech hub, which also is great too. Like I, I'm from San Diego, and I'm always keeping an eye on like is San Diego techie enough yet, um, which it's not yet quite there. Uh, but like those opportunities will also thrive and grow, um, hopefully as you go on, and hopefully like investors also just like move out of Silicon Valley and go to other places too. I think that could help. <laughs> All right, I saw another question, yeah. yes. So I'm sorry, I got, I got three things loaded in the stack. I'll, I'll pop them backwards. Um, number one, the moving, don't do it, okay? <laughs> uh, absolutely don't do it, and I'll tell you why. Is if what you're saying is I need to have peers that I need to interact with, you can find them. Now, we live in a very different world. You can find them on the net, okay? For, uh, for example, my business partner is a technomad. He's everywhere. I don't know where he's gonna be the next month, you know? And we found ways to communicate with each other. I've been a telecommuter, self-employed now, but for now 20 years. You can do it, okay? This is this crazy mindset that you have to come into a particular city, and, and you're right. By the time you get there, it's gone, all right? This is dead. There is no innovation in this part of the world anymore. I don't care what anyone says, okay? This is me <laughs> take, telling you the big picture in the world. So you can do it anywhere, you know, get out there on GitHub, get out there, whatever. Okay, next thing in the stack, uh, the imposter syndrome. Let me tell you, as a long-term engineer, it is impossible for you to know all the tech. People lie about it when they say, I pretend like I know all this stuff. And one of the things I keep discovering, particularly as an older guy, is that I have to keep learning new things. So, you know, I might have been an expert in Mac OS 9. I was, you know, it's gone, right? I might have been an expert in PGP. I was one of the, the original PGP. That's gone. You have to keep learning new things, and you don't know all the tech. All right, you might know a little bit of it, and the stuff you don't know, you'll get to it. The, the one hint I will tell you is be comfortable with being uncomfortable, okay? It's like being in the, on, on the deep end of a pool. You need to allow, your, you need to allow yourself to be uncomfortable. Um, the question for you is um, what do you find as an environment, like what is a good conference today to reach out to people? 
you know, developers, where do they go to now? That's a good question. There's, I think there's a ton. Uh, I only know of the ones that I've heard of or that I've been to, and obviously there's, a, there's way more. I think in the iOS developer community, AltConf and WWDC are kind of the biggest, like, attracts the most people iOS developer stuff, which is why I'm here today talking to y'all. Um, going to international conferences, I think, is another great way of doing this. I often catch myself being like I am in this bubble of Silicon Valley iOS developers. And so in March, I gave the same talk at uh, TriSwift Tokyo. Um, and I met a completely different group of iOS developers, and it really made me rethink, like, what is this iOS developer community? How do I fit into this? How do other people think about iOS development and software engineering? And so that really kind of challenged me to think about it in a different way. So going to different countries from the one that you're in, constantly breaking your bubble, getting to know people from other countries, from other backgrounds, getting to know who they are. Um, there's always new iOS developer conferences spreading up all the time. I highly encourage just going to the ones that are not in the Bay Area, I guess. I'm not a Bay Area hater, I promise, but like, I think it really helps to just get out of this area and find people who are still in tech in other locations. All right, guys, we only have time for one more question. Um, but feel, feel free to after. reach out to me or go after, the, after this question. Hi, so first off, uh, you are amazing and awesome, and thank you very much for putting out this <laughs> message to people. It's really important. Um, my question is, um, I, I, I really, would love you to expand on this idea that different people need different kinds of support and encouragement. Um, uh, my wife and I work with people on the autism spectrum. Um, it's part of a nonprofit that we started. And, you know, it's really amazing to see how much talent people have despite various difficulties that they have and how varied that is. And I liken it back to my early management experience when I was first, you know, became a manager of people when I was, you know, like 24 years old. It was ridiculous. But, you know, I had, you know, people old, much older than me working for me. But what I found was that, you know, you, you're told that you need to encourage people, you need to celebrate them, you need to give them prizes, you need to do all this stuff. I realized very quickly that I had a couple people reporting to me that if I like stood them up at a all hands meeting and gave them a surprise or something, they were, would be horrified, you know, right? So really people need different things and there. Sometimes people just need you to hold space and listen to them, you know, or something. But if you could expand on that and what you've seen talking to all these people and all this wonderful feedback you got on your channel and everything, if you could expand on that level a little bit, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Totally, thanks for sharing all that. And I mean, I plus one all of what you just said. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I can like pinpoint exactly experiences that I had that made me realize this, but working with lots of different kinds of people, like now I'm kind of like, I don't really, I don't assume anything of anybody. Everyone has such a different communication style. Everyone grew up in a very different family from mine, in a different town from mine, at a different time from mine that I will probably never really quite understand fully. And so having an honest, true communication with those kinds of people, with, with those people to just get to understand them, get to know how they communicate. Um, I think actually probably if I had to pinpoint it, like my last team that I worked at, uh, we got really close because we just did this all the time. We were a really tight-knit group, and we often talked about like what makes us feel certain ways and why that is and our upbringing and stuff that like we started off as coworkers but ended up very just getting to know each other really well, and I call them my friends now. But that was all kind of a really important part, I think, of making our team and also just making a really uh, strong software product too because the more that you get to know that there are other kinds of people out there who you don't, um, you might not understand, you might not relate to, makes you realize that, oh, these are the, also the kinds of people, like you're making software for so many people that you also will just not understand. So just being, I think, leading with curiosity and understanding that there are so many different ways to live life. Uh, and, and again, I think this goes back to like always popping your bubble, always be exploring and finding new ideas. But I think doing that will just keep, will keep helping you to, uh, I guess, do better and make better relationships. Um, 
I don't think anybody is perfect at this. Like, in, in, at the end of the day, like, what you end up experiencing and thinking and, and uh, adding to your sense of self is completely random. Like, it, I, it's totally random that I became an iOS developer, honestly. It's totally random that I'm here today. Um, but I think as, as long as you're not trying to, like, strive for this, like, hey, here is this level that I need to get to where I understand all of humanity, because that's impossible. Um, always just leading with curiosity, understanding that you might not know everything, but just be curious and just lead with a good heart, have good, good intent, ask people questions, be curious about them, care about them. We all humans like being cared for and we want to feel like we're mat we matter. So that was a lot, but that is my answer. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for coming.